He has worked on projects in Antarctica, Australia, Belgium, Canada, China, Denmark, France, Germany, Greenland, Iceland, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, New Zealand, North Korea, Norway, South Korea, Sweden, Switzerland, and the UK. Dean White studied chemistry at Florida State and earned two masters and a PhD in geochemistry at Columbia University. Dean White, thank you so much for joining us to teach us about sea level rise this afternoon. Thank you, Alex. And I'd just like to point out that Greenland is indeed still for sale. So if you're... <laughs> if you're if, let, me, let me go ahead and share my screen. So when, when Tom asked me to do this, it was... Uh, the topic of sea level rise is enormous. I teach almost an entire course on that. So sea level rise in 10 minutes is, uh, is kind of a humorous approach, but I, hopefully we can uh, get enough ideas out there that we can, um, uh, see here, share. Hopefully we can get enough ideas out there that we can have a, a, a good conversation about this. So <clears throat> um, just to, to give you a little bit of background, uh, sea level rise is really um, what I would call baked into our future. And that's because the physics of sea level rise are very simple and quite predictable. Um, there's two primary uh, things that happen. One is uh, the ocean's warming up because the atmosphere is warming up and warmer water expands. It's the, the principle behind those cheesy red thermometers that you probably saw as a child. Uh, and warmer water and warmer air then in turn melts land ice. And there's lots of land ice in Antarctica and in Greenland. And both of those things drive sea level rise. Um, also important to point out that the, the link between global temperatures and levels of greenhouse gases on our planet is very strong. So if you look at the last million years of climate, um, global temperatures have gone up and down as the planet has moved closer and farther away from the sun. And that has triggered changes in greenhouse gases that have been very highly correlated. And both of those then are in, in turn very highly correlated with sea level. So as the planet warms up, um, the oceans rise. And as the planet cools down, the oceans fall. What is probably most interesting about that um, <clears throat> is two things. One is uh, how fast and how high. Uh, and those are key questions for us right now. So in terms of how fast, uh, we can expect both a slow continuous increase uh, of sea level rise over hundreds of years, probably thousands of years, um, but also occasional periods of more rapid increase. So um, three feet in 30 years uh, is not uh, abnormal at all on our planet. We are able, by the way, to reconstruct changes in sea level uh, using a variety of techniques. So we know these numbers pretty well. By the way, I chose 30 years because that's a mortgage. So if you buy a beach house and at the end of the mortgage, it's worthless because sea level rose three feet, uh, that's, that's an impact that, that uh, most of us can understand. Also, there are unstable parts of ice in Antarctica and in Greenland. And by that, uh, I mean that the, the bottom of the ice is actually below sea level. It's an artifact of the fact that sea level rose since the last glacial period uh, by hundreds of feet. Uh, and that basically created metastable or unstable chunks of ice. That ice, uh, once it's freed, once it, it's no longer um, touching the, the, the ground, can break off and, and go into the ocean quite quickly. Second big question is how high? So uh, 30 feet, 10 meters or so. Um, <clears throat> that's an easy prediction with the greenhouse gases already in the air. So we have about 400 and something parts per million CO2. Um, we expect uh, that at equilibrium, which will take hundreds of years, but at, at equilibrium, sea level will rise roughly 30 feet. And I'll show you some data here in a second. Uh, the, if we reach sea level, if we reach CO2 levels of 600 to 700 parts per million, we're at 400 now, we started at 280. Um, it's within our reach, by the way, we have enough things to burn to reach six to 700 parts per million. But we know from uh, a number of studies that you hit somewhere in that six to 700 range is where there is no land ice left. So Antarctica melts, Greenland completely melts. And so the max potential is about 250 feet. So when the planet is at its warmest, which it was last time about 40 million years ago, sea level was about 250 feet higher. It's important to recognize we're not debating 
sea level rise now, certainly among the scientific community. Um, rather, we are trying to understand how fast the potential stability points, for example, if we want to rebuild beach houses, is there a place we could do that reliably? Uh, how much of that sea level rise is inevitable, how much it's preventable. Um, and important to recognize that sea level rise is very changeable on our planet. And this is the only slide I will show you with a graph on it, um, but it's, it carries a, a very important message. And on here you see a plot of global mean temperature on our planet versus sea level and a few key time periods. The last interglacial, today is in the middle there, the last, uh, what we call interglacial period, 120,000 years ago, uh, about 3 million years ago, a period called the Pliocene. That's important because that's the last time our Earth had 400 million parts per million CO2. And then the, the, the dinosaurs 40 million years ago during the Eocene. And on the cold side, the glacial period of about 20,000 years ago. Um, what's important to recognize is that from today, the average temperature on the planet is about 15 degrees Celsius. The coldest it got 20,000 years ago was about six degrees colder than that. So if you go from 15 down to 10 and then one more, that's about a six degree change Celsius. Uh, also, the warmest it's been in the last 40 million years was about four degrees warmer than today. So that leads to um, a variability of temperature over the last 40 million years of about 10 degrees Celsius. All right, I'll come back to that in a second. But that 10 degrees Celsius is accompanied by a much larger change in sea level. So for example, four degrees warmer 40 million years ago was 80 meters of sea level rise. And if you want to do simple math, that's you know, roughly 250 feet. Uh, and in the same sense, uh, six degrees colder was about 120 meters lower. So the math actually works out fairly well. Um, you get 10 degree change in temperature over 40 million years, you get 200 meters of sea level change. And so you can calculate that uh, for every, on average, for every one degree C of global change in temperature, either warming or cooling, that will yield about 20 meters of either sea level rise or sea level fall on average. Um, hey, Joseph, we're getting some feedback from your computer. Could you put yourself on mute? Certainly. Thank you. So the, the other important point to, 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 to notice here is that, um, you know, currently our world leaders are arguing over whether two degrees C is a good place to be for the future. And so that IPCC forecast you see there is about a two degree C increase. There's no reason why that point would go warmer without also going up in sea level. So two degree increase in, in, in uh, temperature is eventually gonna give you something in the neighborhood of say 30 to 50 meters of sea level rise. Okay, so other key questions. How much is this gonna cost? Um, and uh, we, we've done the math on this, but the US has trillions and trillions of dollars in infrastructure, homes, roads, military bases, uh, nuclear power plants, etc., that are currently in harm's way from even a few feet of sea level rise, not to mention you know, tens of feet of sea level rise. Um, you can also expect tipping points. Uh, there are nature's tipping points um, because there are, as I mentioned earlier, large unstable ice masses. Um, there are feedbacks uh, as sea level rises that changes the dynamics of, of weather and climate. Coastal ecosystems change. Um, there's a lot of, of natural tipping points out there. But there's also human tipping points. And, and this is another thing that we, we are exploring very much these days. So obviously if, uh, if sea level rises to the point where uh, you can no longer get insurance on your home, that's a tipping point. Uh, and that then impacts tax, tax revenues. It impacts um, other um, parts of, the, of the, the, the economy that depends on housing, which in many vacation areas, which are beach areas, that's a primary um, source of income. Also port facilities, bridges, major cities are on the coast, key roads, rail lines, pipelines, et cetera. One of the more interesting presentations that I sat in on when I was, uh, I chaired a committee on this for the National Academies, uh, we had someone from the military come in and he pointed out that as sea level rises, the bridges don't. And so it gets <laughs> harder to sail their ships underneath bridges. And there are some choke points. So when they design 
aircraft carriers and other big ships, they designed them to just fit under some key bridges around the world, uh, including in the US. And that becomes an issue. They, they have to go in and modify these very expensive ships. Um, so we can have a little fun with this. I know this is not exactly the most light or, or, or it's not a feel good presentation. Uh, this is what 20 meters of sea level rise looks like for the Gulf Coast and for Florida. And as I like to point out to my classes, what is this down here that's really important, folks? Just Disney World. Uh, Disney World, exactly. So Disney World survives 20 meters of sea level rise, right? So that's, there's something good that you can hang your hat on, right? Um, also, and this is probably, as I tell my students, the only thing you're ever going to remember from one of my classes, what is this state right here? on the Delmarva Peninsula? Delaware. Delaware. Delaware is very proud to tell you that Delaware was the first state of the union. Their, their person signed on the dotted line first. It's, it's on their license plate. Uh, with 20 meters of sea level rise, Delaware is no longer a state. It's a, a salt marsh. And so um, as I tell folks, if you wanna to try to remember um, ultimate sea level rise, just remember first in, First out. So if you remember <laughs> FIFO, you can remember uh, major sea level rise. Uh, just a couple of self-serving slides here. One is, this is my granddaughter, Amelia Louise. And it's a quote from me, uh, uh, talks I give in public all the time. Until one generation is willing to forego short-term gains for the long-term benefit of, of its children, we won't be able to address climate change. And this is important because sea level rise takes centuries. But once it's triggered, we don't know how to stop it. And so this is one of these problems that we need to stop now in order not to have our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren face these problems. All right, now I said this is, this is depressing, but you can have a little bit of fun with this. Um, I troll the internet looking for, for really quality uh, examples of understanding of sea level rise, and this is one of them. This is from uh, dogsports.com. Dogsports.com is a website for the Georgia Bulldog football fan. Uh, that's their little logo up here in the corner. And this is a screenshot from them. I didn't write this, they did. Um, and I'll read it to you. The USGS, US Geological Survey, predicts that if ice caps were to melt completely, sea level would rise by approximately 80 meters. That is correct. If we can get the polar ice caps to melt only halfway, sea level will rise 40 meters and the face of the earth will change forever. As a Tennessean, I like to then po poke fun at the Georgians and say, hey, they used math. Um, and then down here at the bottom, now is the time, Georgia fans, trade in those efficient vehicles for a gas guzzler, spray some aerosol, burn as much coal as possible. We can make Florida a thing of the past. So their, their understanding of sea level rise is actually pretty good. And they don't like the University of Florida. So um, this is an example of, of what I call the importance of communication. If you can find common ground, then you can have an opportunity to actually start talking about these things. And I have given talks uh, in Florida and I've given talks in Georgia. And this is one of the ways in which you can open a conversation with people. Right? So uh, I do wanna end with three, uh, I always end my talks with these three slides uh, because it's, I, I wanna leave you feeling better than I, I um, have taken you. Um, so three good thoughts. Number one, uh, because you live on a water planet, the impacts come after the causes by many decades, if not centuries. That creates what we call intergenerational inequity. And that means that until, as I said earlier, until we show our kids and grandkids some love, we're not really gonna be able to solve this. So I, I think it's actually a good thing. I think showing the kids some love is something good that we should do. Thought number two, um, start out in the blue part, you've got about 2 billion people living in poverty on this planet um, so deep that the health of the environment's not really a consideration to them. And this really gets at a lot of what international affairs gets into. Um, there's a lot, of, as you know, a lot of wealth inequity. And if, if 2 billion people are burning coal because that's the only choice they have, then we are all gonna suffer. We share an atmosphere. So at some level, we have to show the poorest of the world some love as well. And finally, we have to control population. And demographers tell us over and over again that the way to control population is to rebalance the power between men and women economically and politically. So I, it's interesting, I have put those red words up, it's time to end male domination um, many times over the last 30 years. 
And uh, I can tell you that it wasn't terribly well received 30 years ago. It is well received now. So I will stop there. I will stop sharing my slides and we can open this up for questions and conversation. Terrific, thank you, Dean White. Before we, before we start the lively conversation, uh, Tom Zeiler, he's the program director of the International Affairs Program and a professor, professor of history. Can you share some insights on the international ramifications of what Dean White has just shared? Sure, well, let me try that. It's some big uh, shoes to fill there for um, Jim. Thank you, Jim, for um, joining us. And Alex, thanks for sharing this. Um, uh, obviously, I've, I've got to defer to Jim, who is, uh, of course, a world expert on this, but I wanted to bring up just a few things, and maybe they can be talking points or maybe not, um, um, uh, as a Georgian, too, and as somebody who just got back from Georgia, um, resent both Tennessee and Florida. Um, but, uh, of course, the reference, for those of you who don't know it, is the biggest tailgating party is Georgia-Florida um, play um, every year. Uh, there's a rivalry. Um you know, I got, when I was listening to Jim and listening to the science behind this, uh, I kept thinking about soft power. We talk about a lot that in, a lot about that in international affairs, soft power. But um, as Jim mentioned in talking about military ports, that is soft power, but the military is hard power too. Um, so what does this sea level rise uh, mean for international relations, uh, much less for Miami and New Orleans and Santa Barbara and, and other coastal places around the world? Um, uh, for the military, you mentioned for ports uh, and, and pipelines, um, for for trade routes too, that that could be very much affected if we have to push things uh, um, into in some other direction. You know, there have been uh, treaties in the past that have dealt with climate, and of course, uh, uh, that's probably for most of you that's not new. Uh, but it made me think of things like uh, uh, remote Svalbard up in uh, in the Arctic, in which. Uh, in which several nations have a piece of that big island uh, to uh, to determine who gets the resources there. And I think that's what we're talking about. How much of that then relates to soft power versus hard power um, is something we're gonna have to see. But I got a feeling because climate change and the environment and these resources is such a huge issue, um, well, you're gonna see nations uh, cooperating, but also clashing. Um, and that's the seriousness behind this, this issue, um, how much we share there. Um, uh, the Biden administration um, has, of course, really thrown its lot in with uh, pretty significantly with a big, big commitment um, to whether it's a Green New Deal, but uh, certainly to fighting climate change. Um, but, you know, it, it always it always always wondered about the inherent tension um, uh, internationally between uh, the economy and trade and development uh, and fighting climate change uh, because they, it can be cooperative and I guess they're mutual, mutually beneficial uh, solutions to both of those. But in a way, if you have a lot of development, you know, you're possibly hurting the climate too. And so who will be the arbiter of that too would be interesting to hear more about. Uh, will it be the United States, one of the big uh, consumers? Um, and, and climate uh, polluters? Um, will it be in international organizations? It does seem like the Biden administration, of course, back in the Paris Protocol. Um, we didn't go into Kyoto, but uh, from 25 years ago, but you know, just wonder, will, we be, will this be um, um, a more multinational effort uh, too? And I think uh, in international affairs, we study that a lot. But talking about the United States uh, with Ted Cruz returning um, from overseas to uh, devastated Texas, um, somewhat today or tonight, uh, got me to thinking also about the role of Congress, um, of national legislators, legislators throughout the world, of, of, of um, uh, populations, of decision makers, and who will be making these decisions, what will be the political uh, struggles ahead in countries um, and especially with this populist wave that has swept a lot of the, the world too, um, that is very much linked, of course, to economics, uh, which is very much linked um, to climate change. And so, th and the skepticism about that um, with, uh, timely with Rush Limbaugh passing away yesterday, but certainly the skeptics there 
um, and even deniers are going to um, have their say about this too. So, so there's a lot here that deals with hard and soft. Let, let me just end with this. We, uh, of course, I'm talking to alums here, and it's great to see all of you um, and, and, and other related people. We have a very big major of uh, international affairs that are very much, this is the uh, concern with climate. This is the, the, the topic, the issue of the day, if not the era. It's not just uh, Greta Thunberg um, and teenagers doing this too. Our, our students are very, very much tied to this. Um, I've found in teaching in this program and, and directing this program for several years now, um, very committed uh, to change. There is a cynicism. They, they smack me around a lot, which I deserve anyway, but it smacked me a lot for ruining uh, the earth and, 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 and leaving this, them with this, this issue. But they're also committed. I think Jim and maybe others might um, agree that uh, these students, uh, you know, there is no Vietnam War where they're out marching. Uh, necessarily, although we saw that this summer on a different issue, um, but there at an individual level, the volunteerism is very high. Um, and I think they deserve to be applauded and supported for that too. And a lot of times they will do this quietly uh, as well. So our majors are, are and, and, and students in the College of Arts and Science and across the, the campus are interested in how this issue and sea level and climate change does affect us domestically, but certainly understand that there are a lot of international roots and problems and issues surrounding this too, as Jim has laid out. Well, thank you for letting me comment. Let's turn over to you and, and, and the expert here. Thanks, Tom. Sure. Who has the first question? All right, I do then. Oh, go ahead, uh, Greg. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a crude way of putting it, but are, are there yardsticks for measuring sea level rise? And what I mean by that, are there designated areas where the very vulnerable communities where this may be measured and then understood, you know, more quantitatively or tangibly, and that you know, nonprofits, NGOs, and others can use that information to, that, to then communicate out? Or is this just something a little more amorphous where we know it's occurring, we know there's, you know, impact, but it's, ne it's never that easy to measure? Or is it, is it measurable? Uh, you can actually, yeah, you, you can measure sea level rise in that sense, but you can also measure it in other ways. And this is where I think international affairs comes in very strongly. So one of the predictable um, uh, outcomes from sea level rise is refugees. So there are many countries around the world on the coast that are low lying. And, you know, we hear about ocean islands all the time, but, you know, Bangladesh and other countries that where you have hundreds of millions of people uh, that at 20 meters of sea level rise or even three feet of sea level rise, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that need to move somewhere else. And doing that without conflict, you know, doing that with, um, uh, you know, without, well, conflict is, is a very difficult uh, idea. It's, and so one of the, so we, we, we measure sea level rise in, in, inches, obviously, but we also measure it in refugees. We measure it in um, uh, financial impacts. Um, you can measure it in, you know, tension between countries. You know, so, so you know, Tom got at this. Uh, the, the <clears throat> there, there will be winners in sea level rise and climate change, and there will be losers. And the winners are going to want to keep going and the losers are going to say, no, we don't want to do this. And the winners, there are some very powerful winners and there are some very powerful losers as well. Do you know, like within, you say, the, the, the states, are there any areas that are where the losers are? Do you know where the first wave of losers will be? Yes. Um, the Atlantic Coast and the Gulf Coast, those states um, will be the... The, the initial losers. And that's because on the West Coast, there's a, the, um, the topography is such that uh, a 
couple of feet of sea level rise, yes, will mean the, you know, have to rebuild San Francisco airport and LAX, et cetera. But um, Miami Beach, for example, doesn't have much of a future. Miami period doesn't have much of a future. Uh, Norfolk, Virginia doesn't have much of a future. Um, a lot of the economy of the Carolinas uh, is driven by the tourism and the you know, beach properties, and that's, they're at risk as well. Um, I have plots of sea level rise for Washington, D.C. And the, um, the joke that I tell is that um, the White House will be riverfront property at some point. And since we all own the White House, you know, we actually, one can, one can imagine it's worth more under that scenario. So. Thank you. Oh, this Dennis. is Dennis. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Of, I mean, one assumes when you talk about sea level rise that it's somehow uniform across the globe, but I'm sure it's not. Can, can yeah. you explain a little bit about where you could expect more versus less? Yeah, no, you're right, Dennis. It's not uniform um, for a number of reasons. Uh, it is... Uh, um, so there are places where the sea level is not level. I'll put it like that. And... Um, as, for example, as ice melts off of Greenland, Greenland goes up. And so sea level rise for Greenland is not as big an issue as it is for, say, uh, the, the east coast of the United States. There are parts of our coastlines that because of the plate tectonics are going up or down. And so the places where they're going down naturally are going to see sea level rise faster in the areas. Um, this is also true um, river deltas, for example, where um, maybe sediment loads are now gonna be dumping more deeply into the ocean. You might see um, uh, an increase in sea level rise in those areas as well. So there's a, there's a, it's, it's definitely not uniform. And you can see that. I mean, if you, if you look around, the, there are some very good maps of sea level rise and you can look and see how they're doing. Um, but you can also just read about it. I mean, there are, uh, Norfolk, for example, is a place where sea level is rising faster than in other parts of the world. Um, and there are, you know, businesses and, and neighborhoods that have had to pull away from the coast. Uh, we have a very large naval base in Norfolk and they're, they, they're looking at rebuilding docks and you know, these are very expensive propositions. So, but that is one area that we, we watch very carefully. I see Stacy has her hand up. Thanks, Alex. And thanks so much for the discussion. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any creative international cooperative agreements or collaborative efforts, I guess you could call them, from two or more countries to establish policy or organizations or um, task forces or whatever it might be to try to address sea level rise? Um, other than the global agreements, which try to get at the root cause, and the root cause is excessive amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which is warming the planet. Um, there have been some very interesting arrangements between countries. Um, Australia, for example, New Zealand have been talking with Pacific Island countries about being a refuge for them when they can no longer, you know, when, when their home is under the ocean. And um, I think those are really interesting arrangements. They're, they have, you know, it's obviously some foresight, um, but obviously it's, I think it's better to solve these problems when it's much less contentious, you know, than when it will be much more contentious. Um, but there have been some, you know, I, I don't know if there have been formal treaties or, or agreements about that, but I, I, that, that may be true. I don't know. Stacy, when, when uh, Dean White was talking about the developing world and how, um, you know, it's going to hit them especially hard, but there are, uh, there are steps that they could take, you know, socially, politically, uh, to address uh, how to fix this, I thought of the exchange, international exchange programs that you put on at your organization. Could you tell us, could you tell the group what you do? And if, 
you know, a dialogue about how often a dialogue about the environment comes into play when you're facilitating those groups? Sure, absolutely. Hi, everyone, nice to meet you virtually. Uh, I'm Stacy Householder. I am a 2008 graduate of the International Affairs Program at CU Denver. And uh, my current role is actually with a, a national bipartisan organization, the National Conference of State Legislatures, or NCSL. And we have um, an international program that I direct. And part of that international program is having relationships and exchanges with many countries uh, uh, across the globe. And we provide um, state legislators, US state legislators, the opportunity to travel to other countries and interact with their subnational um, governing bodies, if you will. And then we also provide training uh, and legislative strengthening work as well. So part of these discussions, as, as Alex mentioned, is often uh, sur uh, surrounds policy and policy areas. Uh, actually, our most recent exchange uh, has been with Belgium, and it's a delegation of state legislators who are really focused on energy policy in particular. So they um, went to Belgium and then a, a delegation of Belgians will come to the United States to learn, um, to learn more about our energy processes and grids and how we use nuclear energy and, and all of that. But um, yes, the you know, environmental <laughs> concepts come up on a very regular <laughs> basis when we uh, do these delegations and these exchanges. And depending upon the state legislators that are on the the exchange, you know, often it can be a real uh, paramount topic of discussion, uh, depending upon what country we go to, too. You know, certainly with our partners in New Zealand and Australia, it's, it's a regular conversation. And if we have legislators who represent mid-Atlantic states or Florida or any coastal state, really, uh, it certainly comes up in discussion. Alex, if I may, um, yeah. I don't know if it's better for Jim or for Tom, but the notion of a jurisdiction over climate change, there's obviously cooperation between countries, there's accords, but uh, you know, is there any sort of level of jurisdiction? Who's in charge of this, so to speak? And if something dire, or things, dire things happen more quickly, for example, are there any apparatus in place from a, an international treaty perspective, for example? Tom, that's yours. I'm trying to think of, I mean, you know, Robert, I can't answer that um, in any, with any definitiveness. I do think that, that a lot of the institutions though, well, obviously the United Nations, but, but um, even institutions like the, a World Trade Organization um, or, or certainly bilateral agreements uh, have a lot of this. Um, in there. Um, I'm not aware though, and maybe Jim, I mean, I'm not to throw it back to you, Jim, but I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's an over, overall international global oversight of this. I mean, you know, you kind of see that in the Paris protocol, for example, and you hope that you get as many nations um, in there. You know, in a way, in a way, because I think climate change or environmental or the resources is such a sensitive political uh, issue at home, at homes, uh, it's it's a bit like the old, um, um, not to get in the weeds here, but the old GATT, the old General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, which preceded the WTO, which was sort of a forum rather than a set of binding comprehensive rules that all nations had to agree to. So I think there's purposely flexibility fle flexibility in there. Um, uh, you know, uh, Stacy and Jim and, and others have talked about some of these bilateral or trilateral agreements with countries um, in certain regions, and I get, and I'm assuming on certain issues that affect them, uh, but I'm not aware of a whole, a, an overall thing. But I could be wrong. This, 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 this is Dennis. Isn't there? A, it's a UN organization, the International Maritime Federation, which is kind of regulating international waters for anti-dumping in particular. Wouldn't they be an obvious choice here? Of someone to, to regulate since it's multinational and most most members of the UN have signed up to that. Yeah. Yeah, for ocean, yeah. Yeah. 
It's, um, you know, this is a, a, um, one of the fundamental mismatches between the problem and our ability to solve it. We have, we don't really have mechanisms at the international level um, that are enforceable. So we have, you know, the Paris protocols are yet another op chance to try to do something that, that we all got excited about and lots of champagne was drunk and then not much happened. Um, it's, uh, you know, as I recently, when I give talks in public, I, I ask people to think about that, that we are, um, we live on a planet that doesn't bend, you know, gravity is gravity and, and you warm up the ocean and the air and sea level is going to rise. You, I mean, you can't, it's just simple physics. You can't do anything about it. Um, and it's not going to be any other way other than that. And that kind of absolute, you know, this is the way it works, um, runs kind of headlong into us as a species that um, uh, doesn't really embrace solutions um, in, in that same way. We like to negotiate. We like to try to figure out a way to deal with this. Um, we'd love to, to figure other ways out of it. You know, you live on a planet that doesn't have that kind of flexibility. So, Can I, can I just add to absolutely, and Jim just used the term enforcement. Hell, we couldn't even really enforce wearing masks in several states uh, in a pandemic uh, at home, uh, much less try to come up with some international agreement. I hate to be negative there, but, you know, the carbon credits and changing is sort of a positive reinforcement uh, mechanism. Uh, but enforcement seems, at least to me, to, to be the, the key here. Uh, you know, nations can drop out of these agreements. Um, uh, it, it's, it's sort of not as... It, it's not like even the nuclear disarmament treaties of the 1970s, and even those could be manipulated too. So it's very tough, very tough to, to deal with this, especially well, at the, with domestic pressures. And as I was saying earlier, there are, you know, there's winners and losers, and I'll use Russia as an example. So Russia really has a lot to win by climate change. Um, you know, their coastlines are, are, generally way far north, they're, they're not popula populated anyway. Um, a warmer ocean would mean that they have access to their ports more often. Uh, there's a, there's a, and they have more land available to them. So there's just a lot that, that Russia gains by this and, and getting them to be part of the solution is, is a difficult problem. One of the, one of the interesting um, questions that CU Boulder is, is deeply involved in is um, can you, if, if you had an agreement, let's say, all right, Zyler, you can only produce X amount of CO2 every year. Um, the monitoring methods we have now is we ask Tom, how much did he produce? And if Tom's telling the truth, fine, but Tom is more likely than not, not gonna tell the truth. And uh, so having mechanisms where you can check that are really important. That was the guts of the, the nuclear test ban treaty was our ability to send seismologists to Soviet Union and they sent seismologists to the United States. And we actually sent them around the world. So you could tell when somebody was cheating and shooting off nuclear weapons. We have that same capability with greenhouse gases. We can actually measure uh, well on the surface and we can tell, all right, Zyler, you're cheating or China, you're cheating or Russia, you're cheating. Um, we haven't pulled that, um, that arrow out of our quiver, but we could indeed have that. And so there's, there's some ability of enforcement. Problem then becomes, you know, what, who's doing the enforcing and, and what are the penalties? We have uh, next up a question from Ira, then Robert Eman, and then we'll get to Nancy's, which she has typed in, uh, I think because of her connectivity issues. So Ira. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was struck during the talk about it's going to almost take a generation to sacrifice themselves for the sake of the children. Uh, I'm of the baby boomer generation and uh, we had a lot of high ideals going into it, said a lot of great things. Uh, I'll say the follow through was really lacking. How do you see the younger generations now? I mean, they're talking the environmental game, this sort of thing. Do you think the follow through is gonna be there and how do you keep that follow through going you know, with the younger people now? Well, Ira, I am by my nature an optimist. Um, I say that a lot, but it's-, I, it's I'm not, I'm a pessimist. <laughs> I, 
I, so let me just tell you a couple of things. One is um, talking to students today, you're talking to a group of people who are far more interested in, in doing something. Um, they're interested in taking action. They're interested in solving problems. Um, I have not heard that from students 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's a very different message that I got from students in the past. So there is something different about the generation of students that are coming up now. We need to nurture that because that's gonna be, it's difficult to maintain that as you know. You know that, was, that was also a, an energy in the 60s and, the, and it, it didn't get maintained. Um, and so the, really the question is gonna be whether or not they can maintain that and they can actually affect change. Whenever I talk to them, I'd say, don't, you know, do not um, ever give up your ideals, you know, um, keep pushing. They ask me what they can do and I say, just keep pushing because somebody's just gotta keep pushing. So mm -hmm. I, I can't answer your question, but I can't look into their hearts and their minds. History would tell us probably not, but you know, and, until, until, some, until a generation figures out, not only comes to the, the conclusion they have to be active, but maintains that activism. Um, this is gonna be a really exactly. difficult problem. So. Ira can, I, Ira, can I just chime in? And I know there's other questions sure. there, but as a historian too, and Jim just mentioned in the 60s, um, Vietnam, uh, civil rights, all um, uh, real problems, all challenges, but it came out of an era of, the, of triumph in World War II in the 50s. Um, and, and there was a certain optimism, and as you say, idealism. These kids I find are pretty much sobered. Um, I know they're the internet generation and they do all this fun stuff, but uh, you know, they, they're, they're so, the kids we're teaching now don't remember 9-11, but they're certainly sort of uh, uh, shaped by that, but they certainly know the Great Recession, which was really a, a second depression. Um, and, and if my kids are any indication, they're in their mid twenties now. Um, I think my son asked me the other day, you know, when the Great Recession happened, uh, Papa, you said, that's it. Once in a generation, you'll never have a tragedy like that. And then they got hit by the pandemic and he called me on that. So they're sober. And as Jim is saying, I think that sort of with that combination of internet, I mean, I'm generalizing here, but there's sort of a technocratic look at things. Uh, even you look at that in politics too. Let's just see what works. We don't need the ideal ideology. I teach U.S. foreign policy history, and I try to get them talking about idealism, realism, other. And they, sometimes they bite. They kind of force them into that. They just want to see what works. Who's pragmatic, um, and what the solutions are. Um, and so I think there's there's sort of an a, a subtle optimism there among them uh, that that you know we're out to solve things. We're not out to change the world in crusade. I agree with that. Yeah, well put. You were all right. I'd love to see it go in that direction. So would I. Robert Eman. Hello. Uh, I, someone mentioned something about trade routes when I was looking at your map yeah. of the uh, the going away of Southern Florida and Mar-a-Lago and then Disneyland <laughs> still stays there. But then also Delaware, at what point does the Panama Canal have a loss? Because it's odd that it, it's got that unique situation, it's West Coast, East Coast, and yeah. would it still be usable as a, as a trade route or would it, would the East part of it be underwater and no longer functioning and would would that be affected as well? Hi, Robert, that's I a great- I don't point. need to make fun of Florida. I was just kidding. <laughs> it's okay, we can make fun. Um, that's a great question. <clears throat> um, I think, as you know, there's a lake in the middle yeah. that's used. And so that you have to balance three. Um, so I don't know. I mean, they've, the locks are built to, for certain heights. Um, I have not looked into that, but my guess is that some engineers have. Um, and I don't They've know. just completed a major expansion of that. Yep. So one would think they thought about it. Yeah. By the way, in terms of trade routes, um, I think you know this, already there's quite a bit of shipping in the summertime over the North Pole. Yes. And that will continue to grow. Um, 
it will really grow. Right now, most of the available shipping lanes run through Russian waters. And so you got to pay money to do that. Uh, in, a, in the not too distant future, when Arctic sea ice shrinks back a little bit further, then you can sail through international waters from Europe to, to China. And from the East Coast of the United States to China and, and Japan. And that will change the, the dynamics in terms of uh, how we move goods around the planet. One other follow-up, if I could. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, three, four years ago, flying back from Europe, went and looked out at Greenland as we were flying over. And there was in the center, we were, I think, fairly dead center over Greenland. There was a massive fissure growing through Greenland, which I had, you know, in 10 years prior, had never seen anything like that. I was struck by it. And is that something that is continuing to grow, I guess, and widen and deepen? There are, yeah. So in Northeast Greenland, in along the Southern coast of, of Greenland, both on the East coast and West coast, um, there are a number of, uh, of these, what I, these are the unstable ice masses I was talking about where the base of the ice is below sea level, which, you know, since if, you, if you've ever had a, you know, a nice scotch with ice in it, you know, you know that the ice floats. So um, that is a, uh, uh, it's unstable. And if the, um, what's been happening is that, that the ice is grounded and as the pinning point begins to be lost, then, then the cracks grow in the ice and it just sloughs off ice a lot faster. Um, it's one of the reasons why I mentioned that sea level rise is going to be episodic. It's not going to be, you know, if it was an inch this past decade, it may be a foot the next decade. So um, we need to be ready for that and prepared for that. We don't know enough about these systems. Um, we've really only been studying the planet with um, uh, any kind of real focus since World War II. Uh, and that, so it's really not been that long. So there's a lot we don't know about the, how these big ice sheets function. With the, uh, all the causes of uh, sea level rising, temperature, things like that, how much will our oceans be impacted, currents change, and therefore impact, impacting our weather patterns? Um, great question. And, and um, uh, we don't know the, uh, put it this way. We, I mean, we can put into our models what would happen if I change, you know, this, this, and what happens to ocean currents. Um, so we can give you pretty decent guesses that there will be changes in climate. Um, but I don't know that we can give you uh, the kind of answer that you would like to use to plan for the future. Um, and that's, again, you know, a, a, uh, you know, we don't, we don't, we spend quite a bit of money on climate models, but, but relatively speaking, it's very small. I mean, I, I once did the calculation, we spend more on movie popcorn than we spend on, <laughs> on, on climate models. Uh, that's, that show, shows you where our priorities are. Um, as a matter of fact, I think you know, some of the, the major tipping points on the planet are areas where ice is important. Um, there's a really excellent little video of sea ice in the Arctic. And when the Arctic is no longer white and reflective in the summertime, but it's blue ocean, that'll be a huge change in climate. And that could happen very quickly. So you could see, you know, in, in our lifetimes, uh, it's quite possible that we could see some pretty dramatic changes in our weather down here uh, in the lower 48 because of changes in the Arctic. And some of that may be due to changes in in ocean currents in response to how, for example, freshwater dumping into the polar regions impacts ocean currents, so. So my follow-up on that is obviously, I'm taking politics out of this. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be looking at our next great migration of people. Yep. Where's it gonna be safe for them to go? Well, I think that's a question that international affairs is. <laughs> I put that back on you. I would point out that the uh, there's already, you know, the beginnings of a land grab in uh, the Arctic. Um, Canada, Alaska, there are already people who are thinking maybe this is the place where I should be investing uh, in, in land. 
because this is going to be it's as time goes by it becomes more habitable it's you know it's pretty pretty harsh right now but as time goes by it becomes more and more habitable i don't think it's it it makes no sense to take the the global refugees which are mostly in the tropics and try to put them up in canada that's probably not going to happen um so i it's to me this is one of the fundamental questions is what do you do with hundred it's literally hundreds of millions of people they're going to have to be rehomed um in this great migration so and 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 in addition, uh, you're talking just about sea level. I mean, there's fires, there's droughts, there you know, there's you're moving. You can't move people to Arizona um, uh, because they got their own problems with with the climate in a different way. They got their own problems. Period. But that's yeah. Well, can come back to Florida too. <laughs> <laughs> but that you know, it, it is. I mean, to me, this is a very interesting sort of historical international question. I mean, we, we established country boundaries in many cases along resource lines, along climate lines. And as the planet changes, you know, you're, you would like to redraw those boundaries, but you can't, or at least you can't from a, you know, we've already drawn the boundaries point of view. So these are going to be gnarly problems. We have a question from, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I look at agriculture going to be tremendously impacted. It will be. Um, that's probably, I, my top three, Bruce, when I think about this are refugees, water, availability of fresh water and availability of food. Those are my top three. I mean, even though I'm a, I, I study Greenland ice sheet and Antarctic ice sheet and sea level rise is something that, you know, is, is I study, it is slow it is you know really going to be damaging it's going to be hugely damaging um but on the shorter time frames on time frames of, of more human interest um you're going to deal with people you're going to deal with fresh water which is a huge problem already around the world yeah. and you're going to deal with food we have two questions in the chat yeah uh, the first one is from nancy who can hear and see us but we cannot hear or see hers so she asked her question um, as such, Dean White, you mentioned Australia and New Zealand working together to address sea level change issues in the future. Are there other regions or countries that you think are leading the change at addressing sea level change currently? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's a great question, Nancy. And I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, there are certainly countries that are taking climate change far more seriously than we are in the U.S., um, which is a low bar. Um, but the, um, certainly, um, uh, Australia, New Zealand, many of the Asian countries, Europe, you know, they all take this far more seriously than we do, whether or not you can then point to action that has led to, um, positive results. I mean, ab absolutely. They are moving faster than we are towards, um, renewable forms of energy towards producing less CO2 and methane in the first place. Um, but they're moving more slowly than the planet would like them to. So I guess the answer is yes, there are many regions around the world that are doing a better job than we are, but are they doing as good a job as they should? And the answer is no. We also have a chat question from Greg. It said, for the Vietnam War and civil rights, activism was aimed at the government with an understanding of legislative solutions. From what I'm hearing, there are few mechanisms for enacting change on the governmental level, no enforcers. So when you tell this young generation to push, where should they be pushing? Pushing the carbon emitters through economic trends? That's certainly one way to do it, um, to insist that your energy comes from um, more renewable sources. Uh, in other words, take care of your own country, take care locally. I think this new generation may be able to tackle the intractable international issues that we have in ways that we haven't been able to. I, I would tell them to think outside the box in terms of forming treaties, enforceable treaties, enforceable actions that we need to take. In the end, for us to live sustainably on the planet as a species, we're going to have to think about the world as a species and not as individual countries. That's just going to create too much opportunity for bad actors to be bad. And so I think one of the 
one of the interesting changes that I would ask them to consider to push on would be this issue of, of we can't do anything about this because we can't make international treaties that, that work. I think we can, but then I'm not an international affairs graduate. And then what should people like us on this chat be doing on a grassroots level, you know, whether it's, it's baby steps or, or appreciating the bigger picture? Well, I think it's important to, uh, to understand the problem and to keep the problem in the, in the forefront of your mind. You know, I tell folks that, you know, the, the most important thing they can do is vote and vote with a sense of, I'm going to vote for somebody who's going to do something about this. Um, in our systems of government, you, that's the, the way to, to, to affect change. Um, I think educating ourselves, you know, thank you for sitting through this. You know, I know it's kind of depressing to hear that, you know, even small temperature changes can lead to eventually, you know, the end of Florida, but um, at least Disney World hangs on for some period of time. You got some, got some hope there. Um, but I think that's important. It's, it always surprises me um, how little that information penetrates into uh, the general population. And eventually we gotta get the general population to at least be willing to accept change. Ideally drive change, but at least accept change. And, and you know, let me chime in here as a historian too. Uh, Cause I'm also an optimist like Jim. I mean, if you look at history there, you know, 50 years ago at Earth Day and an EPA uh, environmental protection agency and, and those super fun cleanups in the ensuing years and everything else were proved problematic. And there were, uh, and Neil Gorsuch's mother got in trouble for, uh, you know, violating certain protocols and things like that. There has been progress. Seems to me that you have um, a center it's not just the Ocasio-Cortez and, uh, and the Green New Deal, although that's very important in driving a lot of the younger people, Bernie Sanders and others. But you've got a center that is pretty, uh, pretty much in consensus that there is a big problem here that needs to be solved. Um, and, and that, but that goes back in, the, in history. Um, it would have been hard for, if you, if you look back in 1970 or 71 in, the, in, in some of the worst times of, of of uh, the Vietnam War, civil rights, or strife, or whatever it was, uh, it was a pretty rough time, late 60s, early 70s, where you did get, you know, some of you remember the crying Native American and, and other things like that, and, you know, they're, they're quaint now, uh, but there was change. Uh, I would say this, as a historian, uh, if you look at the 60s movements, the 60s movements, I think there are two that endured. Um, gay power, or gay pride, uh, and the environmental movement. Uh, civil rights, uh, African American, you know, that has continued, but a lot of, uh, you know, you saw that this summer. Obviously, we still can't deal with race. Um, Vietnam died out, uh, you know, other issues died out, but those, those two movements really, in a way, have gotten stronger and stronger uh, in the country and across the world. And there's a lot of acceptance in both of those, those movements now by the mainstream. So I think there's a lot to, 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 uh, to be positive about. I think we can do, solve these problems. Usually historians are very morose and negative and, you know, because we, we keep, we, you know, our view is you know, the shit keeps just happening for thousands of years, the same stuff. But, um, you know, I disagree with that. Well, thank you for your um, optimistic note, Tom. Other questions? All right, in, in closing, uh, you'll see that there was just a poll added. So uh, please fill that out. It should have just popped up on your screen. Secondly, thanks so much to Dean White. Uh, he did it, sea level rise in 10 minutes. Um, it, was, it was terrific. And thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed seeing some other um, fellow alumni that are passionate about uh, this subject. And lastly, uh, Sarah Myers and Robert Gerlich are have joined us. They are alumni and they are at the Office of Advancement. 
they would be delighted to speak with you if you're interested in uh, pledging a gift to the university to support this current generation of very impassioned um, environmentalists at CU. So, so with that, uh, feel free to stick around and we can mingle or uh, we hope to see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks Alex. Thank you. Thank Maureen, you. It's nice to see you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to all of you for organizing this too. It was great. Yeah. Thanks very much. Hey, Tom, have you read all those books behind you? <laughs> you, you missed my comment of that. There's just, it's just wallpaper. Is it wallpaper? <laughs> yeah, I no, thought so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. Good and for I'm you. Still optimistic. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. My wife calls me that calls this the dungeon anyway. So. Yeah. All right. I'm old. I'm old. I've accumulated a lot of books. Right. Maybe one of our next events can be a Tom Zyler book <laughs> club, like, you know, Oprah, but from the <laughs> international affairs perspective. Yeah. Now, I think this really worked as a topic, too, and I could you could see it's such an important thing to take a current issue, you know, and, and, uh, and talk about these things. I like the small format, too. Did, we had did some interesting people with different backgrounds and different... Yeah and uh, different generations. I feel like it worked out really well to have a good conversation. Yeah, it's interesting. Maureen Halligan, she's a MCDB uh, grad. She, she goes to a lot of things. She's just a curious person, always interested in new things. That's wonderful. You know, this has been one of the, of, the, of the virtual events I've been doing. This has had the most robust discussion. So it's a, it was a very um, apropos and pertinent topic. You know, when I ran one of the raps too, I had Jim in there too. Jim, Jim is very good. I mean, I think it's important to not only have the topic, but you get a speaker. You can get many of us faculty who just, you know, don't do well in a public forum. Um, I think he does. I think the topic's interesting, but Jim especially. So, you know, you just careful about identifying people uh, who do the Effectively. And I think Alex did a wonderful job of keep, keeping it inclusive Absolutely. and including everyone. So thank you so Absolutely. much. Alex. Oh, my pleasure. Did. My experience with uh, when they were talking about the question of the youth and how dedicated they are, my partner is a retired uh, high school teacher, AP rhetoric and composition, and many of his former students are now in college, beyond college, uh, and it's always brought up when they come to visit. They always talk about the environment and there's, uh, and they're passionate about it because they're worried about their future. There's a palpable underlying anger with my generation, the baby boom generation for having caused this and ignored it uh, and talked about it. And, and they really do want, they want results. Like Tom, you were saying, they want results. It's what's pragmatic. How can we do this? We need to do it today. But I think they really are dedicated to it. At least to Robert, Paul Meyer. Robert, so Tom and I have kids of the same age, so we might we might have a similar experience. I almost feel, and you can feel how you relate to this with the, the, the students your partner uh, visits, that visits with, um, almost an existential crisis for some young people. It, it feels like a, a feel of, feeling of doom to some degree. Do you sense that a little bit? Or? Oh, yeah. They talk about it in existential terms, sure. Uh, and that's why they're so adamant that we've got to stop talking. We need to start doing right now, today. Uh, so many of them are, the only candidate they care about is Bernie Sanders. Uh, and then Elizabeth Warren, because she's close behind in that. But they said that's all that matters. Otherwise, all the rest of this is just talk. And we're not going to have a future uh, that we can be sustainable on. And, uh, and when you mentioned the food, they talk about food, they talk about, you know, climate change and, you know, fires and super cold and, but yeah, they're, they're tuned into it. These are bright young people, but uh, it gives me a sense of shame and also gives me a sense of hope that they want to, uh, they really want to affect this change, but they want it done now. Start today. Stop talking, start doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then again, unless the United Nations or some international organization has the power to enforce all this, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. 
You know, I, I also, I, my only worry, my biggest worry for this generation in college um, and high school kids have talked to is this pandemic and coming out of this pandemic. Um, this has really hammered kids. It really has undermined. I mean, not only put plans on hold and study abroad and all these things, certainly they recognize that. Um, and we're, we're going back in person. We've gone back in person at the, uh, the university. I thought there would be more excitement in say my senior seminar. There are, they're happy to do it, but there's sort of like this, yeah, and then we'll be back remote or, you know, what's gonna happen next and how's this gonna be solved? I think a lot of them are happy with the way the election turned out, uh, the way Georgia went, you know, if you're talking at a political level, but this is really like for all of us, all of everybody, I'm looking at everybody, I'm sure it's been draining on all of us, mm -hmm. but there is a, a certain undermining of confidence and, and faith uh, in that I, wor that I worry about a little bit. I know they're young, so they can come out of it, but it's worrisome. Are there any studies comparison of kids here in the U.S. to uh, kids globally on this? Bruce, that's a great question. I. I, I just talked to a friend at Sciences Po in Paris and I asked about the French kids and he found the same thing. He found them to be morose, but yeah, they're French. So you know, <laughs> I, I don't know if Even that, the freedom fry. Yeah, but I, but I don't, that, it, it's a great question. I, you know, I have a couple of Chinese students who are back in China who are looking at this as a disaster. They can't get back to the United States. What's going to happen with my life? Um, and they're, you know, they're upper middle class Chinese kids who are, you know, they're, they're not going to go into factories. So I, I just think that they're, they're, they're worried about, they, they really are. There, there is a, this one, this pandemic really was the big one, um, uh, you know, for them. And, and it's not like a 9-11 where they can, they say, we're going to rally now. We're going to go into Afghanistan. We're going in the military or whatever it is. Um, they're looking for direction on what you do about this. Uh, you know, one thing we've talked about is that th there's not going to be an end point. You're not going to say, okay, August 7th, pandemic's over, and then we can go our way. You know, it's not, it's not as concrete as that, as solution, say, in 9-11, going to war or whatever that was, uh, that drag out. Um, so they, again, there's this confidence. There, there's, there, I, I detected today, even today in a discussion, our classmate today, uh, uh, this there's a cynicism, not toward us, but just toward life no. in general. And this is God. This is what I think wanting. it's because how divisive we yeah. feel. I say we because I'm like a part of that generation. Yep. And I contribute a lot of that to social media. I mean, and now even people who are in high school and in college now are a different generation than I am. And grown up with it. I didn't really get it until I went to college and it still impacts me so much. All we see all day, every day is divisiveness and different opinions and how we never feel like we're going to come together and make a solution. But optimistically, I will say, I mean, just with around my peers, you know, I have a lot of friends who are in different political parties and different belief systems. But in regards to this issue, usually people, at least in my sphere, my age are on the same page of it's happening when you do something. And that's a positive. I think that we can get past certain issues no matter where your background is or what your belief system is or what political party you're in. Um, so I find that to be something to look forward to, optimistic. So, Tom, the reason I asked that question about jurisdiction, et cetera, is because we tend to be, it seems like we're being super reactive, not at all proactive. Um, and so that's sort of the worry there that, you know, there's no one who's saying, and obviously it's a giant world globally, it's very difficult to do that, but there just doesn't seem to be anything that we, gra we can grab our teeth into from a, from a solution yeah. perspective. Uh, you know, Robert, it's a great point you're making. I mean, we've just talked in my class, and again, I do this history classes on this, that uh, uh, we're not going to regret the Cold War is gone, but we're going to regret it in a sense it gave you a, a, a plan, a, a framework. Um, you could be a liberal and criticize that Cold War response too, but at least there was an organization. You knew who the enemy was. but And then you had that what's called that unipolar moment in the 90s when America was the hegemon. And then 9-11 happened, globalization that, you know, we've we're, we're, you know, you can't stop globalization, but we've had this huge debate about what that means. And as Sarah's saying, you know, a lot of that is the internet and communications um, uh, and what Jim is talking about and climate change and the economy. Um, 
we're 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 back in sort of I look at it as sort of a pre World War One period. You know, what nations are there going to be coalitions? Are there secret coalitions going on? New powers are coming up, and it's 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 multipolar in a way. We're the dominant. We're dominant. I'm not saying that we're not the power, and and the and the Japanese are too. Even though you talk about them in decline, and China, but there's a lot of there's a lot of nations vying now for influence. No, it's so interesting that notion of keeping everyone together with a common goal. You know, I'll, I'll use a weird analogy of Tito's Yugoslavia. I'm sure the common goal was they all hated Tito, and then of course when Tito when Tito went. So went Yugoslavia, and obviously long term that's great, but but short term it's sad and dangerous and, and lots of other things. Sure, and it's 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 a real it's a realist argument that you know, uh, be careful what you wish for, you know, uh, mm. freedom, liberty, all that stuff. Yeah, Yugoslavia tear, tear tore itself apart. Um, yeah, it's a tough. It's a Can tough I ask Bruce, Bruce a question, Bruce? You. You're a scientist, am I, you're, you're a geology major? Yeah, I'm a geology, yeah. So I thought, yeah. So yeah. You're, you're a hydrologist, but you work in the water. Field. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. LinkedIn, you know how it is, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I deal with a lot of geologists as a, as a fundraiser because I go to Houston or did go to Houston a lot. Oh, we, are you in Houston? No, I'm in Boulder, but I go to Houston all the time because- I, I used to be in Houston, so maybe that's- Yes, and, the, and they're suffering today. I spoke to a bunch of people, yeah. even as far north as Willis, that are having uh, freezing issues. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the uh, Ira was up in Dallas. He just got EPAC on. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's, oh, yeah. Oh, so you know, uh, yeah. Ira was. Yeah, he's. Yeah. Exactly. Ira yeah. and I were. Ira and I were roommates back here when the Flatirons were being built. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, well, that's great. No, I know Ira a little bit because I go to Texas and. Uh, yeah, I knew, uh, I knew, you know, he worked for Richards, he's in the advertising agency, and yeah, I've had good fortune. That's how I know your name, Robert. I'm with the Alumni Association, too. Oh, well, brilliant. And we're, when we're trying to link up the Dallas chapter. Yeah, perfect. And the same thing with, and the same thing with Houston. So you're welcome here. And we always have geology events that we always can invite you to as well. All right, great. And, and you mentioned that. Let me put my two cents worth in. I think this forum worked, and I would love our advisory board and our program under me to think about this as a regular thing, an international, either call it an international affairs forum or a public affairs forum, link with the alumni association in some way, make this a regular, a regular thing. I mean, I could, I could work with my home department in history, but I think international affairs is a good place oh. to run a lot of this since we're in, you know, we're so multidisciplinary. Yeah. Um, so if our advisory board is into that kind of thing, I think it could be a really I love the idea. I already have brain listed a list of guest speakers for, for one yeah. of them. So I'm ready uh, to deploy. I tell you what, would be a great guest uh, speaker if we could get them. I can't remember. The um, people that put together Social Dilemma are from Boulder. Oh, yeah. That's a great documentary. That's a great. And in fact, as you brought that up about social medias, and yeah. that is, I'd be interested in how much influence social medias have. Again, out globally, not just here in the U.S., we got 24-7 talking heads. I think everybody should watch Social Dilemma. Yeah, it was definitely eye-opening. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, that notion uh, of the international event we're doing with AI, yes. artificial intelligence, we can mm. certainly do an event on artificial intelligence, the fears of it. We're looking at Alex and Bruce and Robert, and those who don't know, um, we're looking at AI from a bias perspective, whether it be machine language biases for people of color, you'll get different mortgage rates, you know, in different parts of the country for different reasons, you will know the story, or face recognition issues. Um, so we're sort of looking at it, we have some linguists, we have some computer science people in that call for an international crew of alumni. So that might be an AI might be another interesting. That'd be really interesting. A really good idea. I, I was also thinking, and, and, and Robert Amon and some others talked about students, is very carefully recruiting some either graduate students or international affairs honors students um, to these. Some of the questions you're asking, why not turn over? You know, what are you students? What are you thinking about? You know, I we could probably identify two or three of these kids who would be pretty, imp they're pretty impressive. And some of our global grant uh, that was, winners. That was um, my thought, yeah. They, you know, and I don't, but I don't know if that would be appealing to a general alumni audience to have students there too, but. Oh, Just, I, think, I think. Well, I don't know if you all. Two days ago, they had the uh, three three minute thesis. Yeah. Um, oh, discussion. 
which was fantastic. Um, I've been doing that for the last many years. Just getting half of those kids yeah. on a forum and give them five minutes. They were amazing. Well, we, we've, we've launched, um, we've launched uh, Alex's launches mentorship program. Robert's part of it uh, with, uh, you know, linking an, an IA major. But the idea was also to have some honors, all these honor students sort of present. So something to think about. Yeah. And maybe and maybe maybe Zoom, maybe Zoom continues in that sense. Once the pandemic's over, we, we Zoom. We, we spoke about that in geology. Uh, I, I'm not involved directly with geology only because I go to Texas and I'm involved, but um, the geology advisory board thought the same thing. We'll continue with these things on Zoom. Why wouldn't we? Because we have people and then we can invite speakers from all over the world. You know, it doesn't matter where people are. Yeah. So it's lovely. Yeah. You guys are great. Well, from Sarah and I perspective, we're thrilled to help. We're thrilled to be involved the more the merrier. And right. Nikki's always so kind to do all the heavy lifting for us. Make yeah, it thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Bruce and Robert, for attending. Robert, sorry, sorry. So, Robert, do you have my contact information? Uh, no, but I, uh, I can find it. I find you. I'll do it on LinkedIn if that's easier for you. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to talk to you more. No, I'd be mm -hmm. so delighted. Lovely to. Sorry, you. sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, no, no that's like, okay. I was just yeah. saying. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to leave shortly. I, I'm Tommy. You'll be yeah, excited. I'm, I'm going to my French class. <laughs> okay. Enjoy. 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 <laughs> okay. Okay, au revoir. Thank you all. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, guys. Thanks, Alex. My pleasure. Thank you, Robert, for joining us. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Bruce. Bye, thanks. Great to meet you.